Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and I can see the forest for the trees. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, here we go. All right, sometimes before you can see the forest for the trees, you have to get lost in the woods. And that's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> so Bewley dropped me in the middle of Sherwood Forest here and spun me around and said, find your way. <laughs> but I found it. I found it. <laughs> and he unwittingly helped me find it. All right, and, and that path branches through just about every aspect of the Mud City Paradigm puzzle tree <laughs> that there is. It's really getting to be uncanny, I guess, trying to find a new, <laughs> a new word, right? But as with all good installments, right, we have to begin with, Fal we have to go right through Falcon's Maze. And what's Falcon's Maze in this case, but it's, but it's Sherwood Forest here. And this is actually a picture of Sherwood Forest. And I think it's interesting that there are birch trees here which associates me more closely to north northeastern American forests, like in Massachusetts and Connecticut, New England. You know, lots of birch trees in New England. Not so much here in Maryland, which I think is interesting, of course, because I'm trying to tie the forests here now, right? Because the very first thing that happened to me when I decided to Google Sherwood Forest, of course, because when he dropped me here, I wasn't sure that that Sherwood Forest was like a real place, right? But it is. And when, so when I started my investigation, it just Google Sherwood Forest and... And it says, Sherwood Forest, still a merry place, Baltimore Sun. <laughs> Wait a minute, what? And sure enough, and sure enough, there is a there is a Sherwood Forest here in Maryland. There's also a Nottingham. Right? And Nottingham is right near a place called White Marsh. And that may or may not hold some significance as we move forward with this Mud City Paradigm puzzle tree. Right? And all right, so Sherwood Forest here in Maryland, right? Yeah, it's still a merry place. And Right? I love it's written by Joni Gunn, right? <laughs> and look at these threes, right? March 30th, 2003 at 3 a.m. <laughs> the threes haven't popped for me in quite a while. So that's, and so the Sherwood, and so of course, the Sherwood Forest has an interesting story here in Maryland, right? And it's on the Severn River, which of course correlates back to Wales and the Duke of Gloucester and all of that, <laughs> right? But, right? But what it is, is it's a private community. And it started out in the uh, early 1900s, 1915, as a summer camp for urban families hoping to experience country life. You know, it was a it was a large camp, right? And so the Baltimore bourgeoisie would go in there to learn to hunt and fish and, you know, rough it 1915 style, right? But then along the way, it stops becoming a summer camp. And then, and so sometime between 1915 and, and the early 1930s, more specifically 1933, right? it transitions into a, a private community, right? And so, you know, 500 bucks for a cottage in 1933. And so in 1959, it sold for 5,000, right? And today they sell for 500,000, which again, remember this is 2003. So 17 years later, I would imagine that these are million dollar, that there's a million dollar price point in this neighborhood today, right? And so of course, location, everything, as I was saying on the Severn River. And even more amazing is that it's only just minutes away from where Maryland has its annual Renaissance Festival, which is, of course, in Crownsville. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, and again, this is really kind of the amazing thing that's sort of happened investigating Poe here in this and finding Bewley's genealogy and what I think has been happening with Poe's narrative in the modern era, right? And so I didn't see how when I started, I didn't understand how, you know, how much it was going to connect to everything. And because Bewley really had me spun around, you know, I was bouncing from his tree to tree going, what's this? What's this? You know, my best Jack Skellington, you know, because that's what I do. <laughs> and, you know, I, I was realizing I was making all of these connections to the different aspects of the Mud City show, you know, and Baltimore and the Jubilee and Master of Reality. I mean, this was branching out into all of that stuff. You know, the, the, uh, the names, the trees, as I'm now calling them, the plants <laughs> right, that are out there, right? And, you know, because what's happening here at this point is it's not so much about who most of these Poe people were, and we're going to establish them a little bit. You know, there's only a couple I really want to talk about in depth, but it's their proximity to people and places <laughs> that get to be very, very interesting. 
right? And so when Bewley dra and so when he dropped me off here and showed me this, and I saw Underkeeper and Sir this Sir John Byron, who we're going to talk about in just a minute, as as keeper as the keeper of Sherwood Forest, you know, and I not really having an understanding that Sherwood Forest was really like a real place and not just <laughs> something from Robin Hood. I needed to find out more about these roles, and 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 again, we're going to tie it all together. So, you know, what Sherwood Forest was. You know, and so Sherwood Forest is a royal forest, right? And the disappointing thing about this Wikipedia article is it doesn't really get into the history of it the way I think that it should, given that it does have this rich history, right? Uh, and some of the things that were taking that could have been taking place in Sherwood Forest in the in the 15th and 16th centuries. I mean, the story is really kind of crazy. But the short of it is that Sherwood Forest is a royal forest, which is like a, it's a protected forest. Like today would be like a a nature preserve or a national national park or something like that you know you you couldn't hunt on it you know you couldn't um you couldn't cut down its trees for lumber or anything like that they were protected lands and and those activities were only privileged to the king and the aristocracy of the day right and so they had to police those areas right and so the the interesting thing about royal forests is it is a practice that doesn't start until the norman invasion Right. There's no evidence that the Anglo-Saxon kings created royal forests or enforced forest law, right? And that the uh, and that William the Conqueror brought it with him in that it was a holdover from the Carolingian and Merovingian dynasties. And now this is where the story crosses into what you know is Baltimore and where Baltimore is is going. And and that's the thing about this post story is that I kind of really have to spoil the endings of those of those series without actually, but I will, it is, it is my goal to, to do those series and see them through to the end because that's, because it, it really is boggling my mind at how the post story touches on, on so much as we're, you know, as we're going to, as we're about to see. Right? And so again, these Carolingian and Merovingian legal systems, they go back further and further. And, you know, again, Baltimore, the whole point of Baltimore was connecting, you know, the founding of the city of Baltimore and its role as a as a very high ranking pagan center of worship right, in the recent past right, and connecting it to the most ancient religions. Right. And so that, you know, that trickles its way down through all of these dynasties here. Right. And, you know, so it's interesting that, you know, when you're trying to make that case coming forward, if there's a lot of you know, if, if those elder religions have any sort of truth in them and that there are these, you know, creatures, <laughs> you know, or at least one time were, you know, cutting deals with mankind and being worshipped and so forth. And, you know, it's really interesting finding that, those things in Baltimore and tracing them back and further and further and to now have it touch and to now have that connect in Sherwood Forest you know, and connecting the concept of forest law and creating royal forests as a refuge, because we now we know, you know, in, in Scotland anyway, there were little green men. <laughs> you know, the Scottish fairies were out there, right? and they needed to be fed. <laughs> so, you know, you know, if the Normans are bringing along, if they're, I mean, because this is this is just an ex expansion thing. You know, they're just moving from. You know, they just keep, you know, as the Ike's theory suggests, you know, they just move their way along here, these royal bloodlines, you know. You know, just keep the thing moving, you know, so it doesn't all look quite the same, right? So, because when, when he comes in, right, he, he's, he sections off a huge portion of England. More than one-third of the country becomes royal forests at the beginning of William the Conqueror's reign, right? And it says right here, yeah. Right, starting in the 11th century, right, and the height of its practices is the 12th and 13th century. So, you know, you're looking at, at 300 years here, fully one third of the land area of southern Scotland was designated as a royal forest. And at one stage in the 1100s, right, all of Essex was a forested, right, on the ascension of Henry II. So this is a map of the royal forest from 1327 to 1336, right? And now, so this is about a century after the practice of, so this is like a century after the practice of royal forestry was at its height, right? And what forest law was and everything, right? And so just to demonstrate that, like all of Essex over here, this, this whole little bump, 
was a royal forest, right? And if you're the, if one of the whole biases, one of the whole conceits of your of your overall show is that, you know, the royal families who you know are potentially running this whole thing, you know, are worm knights, right? And directly connected to the ancient religions, right? Through bloodlines, you know, what what better find than to be able to tie the families you're looking at to areas that were once covered in royal forests because what do worms need? <laughs> because what do worm knights need you know they need forestry they need places to squirm around in right and by worms in this case you know it's i'm almost using it as ubiquitous for almost any woodland type creature you know but the the bloodlines you know the way that the story is presenting itself through gnosticism and yaldabaoth and, and all of that through the canaanite religions you know coming across these royal forests where these Worm Knights, when they were establishing their either conquest or just, you know, you know, when they were making their way, coming in and taking over you know, as, in the story as they presented to us, you know, they would need and connect to those, you know, because if any, if, you know, mythology teaches us anything, marshlands and forest lands, you know, that is a home of these, of these uh, gods and green men and, you know, and, you know, and that in the end, you know, the major religions that we have today are just, you know, facsimiles of these pagan, ancient pagan religions, you know? <laughs> so, you know, it's really kind of interesting the way this is coming together. You know, because all of this region down here would have been royal forests as well, you know, where the Shaftesbury's come from, right? And the Lennoxes, right? And the Cornwallises, all right, all come from this region. And so now it's hard to ask for more than being able to connect my worm knight families that I'm finding in my false paradigm research out of Baltimore and Maryland here to these royal forests and how those families were installed there during the Norman invasion. And, you know, again, I haven't in my show brought it back through Baltimore to those earliest religions, but that, again, that's the way all of it's going, right? And, right, and now, so by connecting it to Baltimore, of course, I mean that, you know, what was Baltimore originally, and what was Maryland all about, you know, back in the early 17th century? And so I brought up a couple of maps to kind of illustrate, like, you know, what was Baltimore, you know, back in the day? Well, I, I, you know, as I'm beginning to believe that it was a royal forest, because that's part of its story all along as well. And because the earliest observations of John Smith as he was exploring this area in the late 1500s and early 1600s was the trees you know i mean he was very excited by the number of trees he was finding you know because you know there was a tree shortage back in england i guess because they you know they kept making the royal forests smaller and smaller but you know perhaps what they really did was transport transport those deities over here for a while because that's you know that's part of the the mud city paradigm puzzle tree <laughs> is that you know forests would have been very magical places you know and, and are still very magical places so this map is from 1750 and, and a couple of interesting features about this map is that you know when you come up in on it right see this is uh, the area of what baltimore is today right this area here right and, you know baltimore county right the city would be all down in here all of this would have been forest right and you know again making the connections to the, some of the families that come over and settle this region and its location to the chesapeake bay and and so many other things you know have, again haven't even touched on the Susquehanna's role <laughs> at all and someday d i'll get there <laughs> right really a very good environment if you are sort of doing this you know transplant of your woodland gods from forest to forest across the world as they set up their you know, and do the jobs they're supposed to do. <laughs> yeah, so, all right, so this map, 1750, and I just wanted to show then the 1792 one that I've used in the past, right, which is this one. You know, it shows Howard's Wood here. And now, you know, we talked a little bit about the name Howard and the history of Baltimore and how it connects back to the royal courts and stuff like that. And, you know, his, his name does touch in on the Poe story as well and how all this land was at one time his forest. You know, is it Howard's Royal Forest? It gives a bunch of this land to all the major religious churches of the day, <laughs> you know, right? And one convenient area for them to all, you know, sort of hang out together and be buddy-buddy. You know, so now connecting this concept of the royal forest and, and the Poe family and some of these other families, you know, and finding how it ties to so many 
other elements in the uh, mud <laughs> in the mud city paradigm puzzle tree <laughs> right because it really does start to tie together through here because with the people and the places that this thing branches out and touches it's just absolutely incredible and that was kind of the thing about it I, you know i felt that like Bewley was planting all of these trees for me to find right and and i was finding them and i was making the connections but you know it just wasn't coming together the way i really wanted it to <laughs> and right and he gave me this gift this this hook this tie that's going to bind this thing together you know and so unwittingly <laughs> because he never thought that somebody would be coming and camping out <laughs> for like 2 weeks looking to find deception you know and and deceive he does and he does it in very broad strokes so broad that they were just so hard for me to see that's why i needed to kind of camp out for a while and you know again because i think part of his objective here is to throw is to throw shade over certain trails and pose ancestry right and he does that with this because this richard poe he finds as the undertaker of sherwood forest you know he's the great grandson of this william Pooh or poe here right who has a will dated 15th of july 1557 all right so it's not without it's well within the realm of of reason that he he could have been 50 60 years old here it could have been 70 80 you know he could have been younger as well but you know not without you know, but certainly he could have been born in the latter half of the, the 15th century, you know, and his family and where he's from, they dealt around Sherwood Forest and Papplewick and this whole area. You know, that's where they dwelt, you know. And so if there's him on record, it also stands to reason that there would be other Poes in this area. And he talks about that a little bit, that there are Poes all over this Nottingham, this Nottinghamshire region, you know, in Sherwood Forest. It's this William Poe's great grandson, who is this Richard Poe as underkeeper of the Sherwood Forest, right? And he serves as underkeeper to Sir John Byron. You know, one thing about for the Royal Forest and the Forest Laws, of course, you know, they had to they had to police these regions. And so, and this is where it struck me that Bewley had one of those, you know, questionable omissions here, you know. How did how could he not possibly think about this? Because, you know, within what like the Royal Forest was and and forest law, right? You had they needed to police these regions, right? I mean, it was restricted land. Right? And but it was populated, you know, people lived on it in the forests. Right? And there were villages all over the place. And you know, so the underkeeper, the position of underkeeper of the forest was was created, right? And you know, underkeepers, that was a hereditarial position. You know, it was passed down from generation to generation, right? Long family lines of of keepers, right? Because he mentions that here that the Byrons had been stewarded, stewards and wardens of the forest of Sherwood from 1485. Now you think about that, 1485, that's also about the time that William Poe, Poe, where did he go? Right, whose will was 1557, could have been alive, right? So we know that the job of the keeper, right, the sheriff, <laughs> you know, if this, if this title is hereditary, right, it stands to reason that the underkeeper title, that the underkeeper title could be hereditary as well, right? And that the Poe family had this position for generations. You know, at least three, you know, is possible given these dates, right? And, you know, nowhere, nowhere in this book does Bewley make any effort to suggest that. It, it like it doesn't, like it's beyond the realm of possibility but he knows that it's a it's you know it's a hereditary position and was you know i mean you could lose it you could upset the king and he would terminate you and bring in another guy and then it would be his family for however many you know generations you know and i'm sure some of them lasted many more than three generations you know and it's interesting even so much so that there that there was a poe that was underkeeper and that these Poes could have been, and that this Poe family was connected to the royal forests in this manner. You know, but it's also who they were as property owners in and around England and Ireland come the, the middle of the, of the 17th century, you know, in their proximity to people, as I think I said earlier. And so now the reason that I think this curious omission is really, really important to the overall story of the of the mud city paradigm puzzle tree <laughs> is that is something else that he does right and again as i was 
I was stumped. I was lost. You know, I had made so many connections and ping-ponged my way around, you know, the connections that he showed me here. You know, that I... I, I and so that's why I kind of took a little break from the material. Right? I Certainly, I thought about it, but I did not look at a single web page over the last, like, week or so until, like, Tuesday. Right? And... Um, but I didn't look at any of the pages. I wanted to come back and, and kind of have fresh eyes because, again, I felt there was something missing. Right? Something just wasn't tying all these connections together the way I wanted them to. All right? And so, you know, it was Tuesday morning, and I was reading through the preface yet again. You know, I probably read it like ten times. <laughs> right? And so I read through, and, you know, for whatever reason, you know, when I got through to the end, right, he signs it, Fitzwilliam Place, Dublin, September 1906. And so I read that, and it's just been amazing because, like I said, without looking at any of the material but thinking about it over the last week or so, you know, I've been really amazed at some of the connections that I'm about to draw in the next episode <laughs> to um, all of the, as I've been saying, the, all of the elements of the story, right? And I've been thinking about how it's been connecting, you know, the idea of Sherwood Forest and forest law and woodland mythology you know, to Baltimore and the Howard's Woods and, and their connection to the religious centers in America at that time, especially Roman Catholicism. And, you know, trying to, to draw all these pieces together for him to sign the September 1906. Well, that's that's the same time that the Jubilee was happening. Right. The Jubilee was uh, September 10th through the 15th. If I, remember, if I remember correctly, the Jubilee proper was like September 9th or 10th through the, the 14th or 15th, All right? And, you know, again, I, I have to spoil the ending of it here to make the connection really click, but, but the whole story of the Jubilee is that it was the last time that the old gods were among us, right? And then, you know, they had kind of completed their part of the job and had moved away and were on to wherever they were going. Right? But that's what the Jubilee really was. It was the celebration of the end for them and a transfer and a transfer to what was coming, right? You know, because you gotta think about it within ten years of of the Jubilee, you know, the world erupts into World War One and beyond, right? You know, and things really change after that. All right, so that's that's what that's what the Jubilee is, right? And so Edmund T. Bewley, with his contacts, as he was writing this book, he would have been well aware of the fact that the, the, the homecoming, as it was, and that's, again, part of the whole thing with, <laughs> with the Jubilee. And I, and I think it's important to remind everyone at this, <laughs> at this time that, where is it? Oh, we are still on Monday, September 10th. <laughs> We are still in the first day of the Jubilee because this is where Master Reality started. You know, this is as far as I got as I got with it. But there's no way he wasn't familiar with the fact that the homecoming was going on in Baltimore. And that I don't think that that, that is a coincidence to perhaps erasing the, the concept that Poe's family were longstanding deputies of the Sherwood Forest and the connections that can be applied therein. Right? And, so, and so thank you, Edmund T. Bewley. <laughs> for leaving a few threads for me to pull on from your spinning wheel and allowing me to 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 find my way out, out of Sherwood Forest and and so hopefully in the next episode I can really start connecting these dots because they they really they fall together like dominoes it's gonna be bang 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 <laughs> and then I'm gonna be able to move the story forward <laughs> to his mother and so forth but so okay <laughs> so hopefully this one comes together and makes any sense at all <laughs> I hope you guys had fun with it because I certainly had a blast making it. <laughs> Just because you don't know the truth doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lie. <laughs> so until the next one, cheers, guys.